Hi everybody. So welcome to today's session. So today we're going to be looking at lawmaking in Wales and England, starting from the Norman Conquest and working our way up to present day. In this session, we're going to include constitutional principles, lawmaking, judicial precedent and statutory interpretation, and then we're going to look at joining all these elements together. So the idea of this session is not for us to go into enormous detail, but for you to understand how all these elements connect together and hopefully make more sense of our legal system. Okay, let's get going. Okay then, so we're going to start off with constitutional principles. Now we have, as you know, an unwritten constitution. Therefore, there isn't one single document that has all our fundamental laws um, and how we govern the state in it. So our law is made up of customs, precedent and statute law. Now we're going to start off, kick off and talk about the separation of powers firstly. Now the separation of powers isn't actually a new concept. It goes back to the Greeks and Aristotle. But the main theorist that we refer to when we're talking about the separation of powers is Montesquieu. Montesquieu advocated that there should be three arms of government. There should be the executive, the legislative and the judiciary. And what he suggested and proposed was that each arm of government should be separate. And this was the only way to maintain checks and balances in our system. And by doing this, we support our democracy and we hopefully help with maintaining um, the liberty of society. OK, so our next constitutional principle. So the next one, which is incredibly important, is the rule of law. Again, like the separation of powers, this goes back a long time. The rule of law, when we think about the rule of law, the main theorist who comes to mind is Dicey. So Dicey was writing in 1885 and Dicey put forward, amongst lots of um, other suggestions about the rule of law, is that it was essential as far as our uh, democratic system and that there were three elements that had to be in place for the rule of law to actually work and be, be evident. And that is, there must be a lack of arbitrary power of the state. There must be equality before the law, so therefore everybody gets treated equally. And he also recognised the supremacy of the ordinary law or judge-made law as far as actually protecting citizens is concerned. Now, there have been other interpretations, as you can imagine, of the rule of law. Um, 1885 is quite a long time ago. So you can look at other theorists such as Raz, Thompson, and more recently, Lord Bingham, who wrote a very good book on the rule of law. So the next constitutional principle that we're going to be looking at is the sovereignty of Parliament. Now, the sovereignty of Parliament, as we know, is uh, one of our most important principles. That's because when we look at our, uh, our pyramid, we can see that it's, it's uh, pretty much in, underpins our, our whole democratic system. Because, of course, we vote members of Parliament into Parliament, so it's vote by the people, as it were. And that's why parliamentary sovereignty is possibly our most important constitutional principle and why the judges have to follow the will of Parliament when they're applying the law. Now, of course, what you realise is that all these constitutional principles are all interlinked. They all kind of rely upon each other. 
but there is one common thread that runs through every single one and that is human rights, especially since the enactment of the Human Rights Act in 1998. So for example, when we have a bill that goes to Parliament, they have to consider if it's um, an issue which uh, relates to human rights, they have to make sure that that legislation complies with the European Convention on Human Rights. The courts have to take account of human rights when they make a decision. And if the judges feel that um, our legislation conflicts with human rights and the convention rights, then they can issue under section four of the Human Rights Act, a declaration of incompatibility. But of course, because of parliamentary sovereignty, it doesn't mean that parliament has to change the law. So parliament has that ultimate power. Okay, and human rights, finally, when we think about the rule of law, comes into that as well, because with the rule of law, we have equality before the law. And if we think about our convention rights, we have Article 6, where there is a right to fair trial. Therefore, everybody should be subject to due process in the same way. Moving on to lawmaking. So primarily, firstly, it was um, the UK Parliament that had power, was given power to make law in England and in Wales. But over time, Wales has moved towards actual lawmaking powers itself. Since devolution in Wales, Wales now has the power as well as the UK Parliament to actually create primary legislation and pass delegated legislation. So powers have been devolved to Wales, but they're only in certain areas and this power is conferred. So for example, health, education, housing. Okay. And the other thing, of course, that we've got to think about as far as um, legislation is concerned is it, it, it's an ever changing landscape. And so sometimes we have law that's passed um, very quickly as a necessity. So, for example, some of the coronavirus legislation that's been passed, um, giving us rules as far as our behaviour and so forth. And that's in Wales and then separate rules in England. Other times, legislation takes far longer to be proposed and then passed. And we have certain agencies and certain ways of doing this. For example, we have judicial precedent, where we have a case that comes before the court and then, then that um, possibly changes the law in the future. An example would be R versus R in 1991. We have the Law Commission, which was a body, a permanent body that was set up in 1965 um, and is there to uh, review the law on an ongoing basis. And that sometimes takes a really long time to put proposals together and change the law. We have pressure groups. So pressure groups such as Amnesty International, Greenpeace. Um, so they're also bodies that we need to consider as far as changing the law. And there are also public inquiries and commissions that are set up in response to a situation that propose changes in the law. OK, then. So we put this all together in the form of a triangle. And so our whole legal system sits as a triangle. And at the bottom of that triangle, we have the beginnings of our legal system, which started in 1066 with the Norman invasion. As you'll remember, our law is based on customs that existed in the country before the Normans conquered. 
the Normans took these customs and created a unified system across the country. We had two different systems running initially at the same time. We had common law, but we also had another strand called equity. Equity meaning fairness. Eventually, these two systems merged in 1873 in the Judicature Acts. And now, both these areas of law, that is common law and equity, can be applied in the same courts. So in the beginning, England was the main power base and therefore exerted power in the form of lawmaking powers over Wales. So, as I've said, this has kind of been going an ongoing battle um, and later debate between England and Wales with Welsh devolution eventually led to lawmaking powers being given to Wales. Our law is pretty much constantly evolving, as I've said, so law reform has constantly and is constantly shaping um, the law that's being proposed and being made in the UK Parliament or now the National Assembly of Wales. Now, any law can be uh, applied in our courts and is applied in our courts. Um, it can be in the civil or criminal courts and this happens through a process of judicial precedent. Now, sometimes the law isn't clear and therefore, if the law isn't clear and the intention of Parliament isn't clear, then judges can use statutory interpretation to decide how to apply that law. And they can use certain methods, such as the literal method or the golden method. And the whole idea of this is to make sure that they follow the will of Parliament or indeed now the National Assembly of Wales. So a huge influence, and I cannot emphasise this enough, is human rights. Human rights on our law is really, really important. And this has certainly grown since the enactment of the Human Rights Act 1998. And what this act did is it introduced the European Convention of Human Rights into our domestic system. Therefore, we could apply that law in our courts from around 2000. So constitutional principles such as parliamentary sovereignty, the separation of powers, independence of the judiciary and the rule of law are like the glue that holds our unwritten constitution together. They inform, support and educate and promote the idea of equality before the law and ultimately a civilised and democratic society. OK, then, so I hope now, after watching this session, this is all so much clearer. Well, I'm off to go and get a cup of tea now, so I suggest you do the same thing. <laughs>